Welcome back. We're talking about the spread of ISIL as the group's territory contracts in the Middle East. It's taking the battle to Asia and beyond. Still with us, Richard Hedarian is a geopolitical analyst and professor at De La Salle University. Dimitri Babbage is a political analyst at Sputnik International. Abdel Bari Atwan is editor in chief of Rai Al Yum Arabic Independent Newspaper. And David Gottenstein Bars is senior fellow with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Let's get back uh, to our discussion. Richard, let's look uh, again at ISIL in the Philippines. Uh, when we look at the group, say, in uh, the southern Philippines, are these homegrown activists, homegrown militants, or are these people from other parts of the world coming to the Philippines? Well, it's always a combination of different factors. I mean, without a question, groups that have pledged their allegiance to ISIL have been there for quite some time. You have groups like Abu Sayyaf, from which Isnilan Hapilon comes from. You have a group like Bangsamore Islamic Freedom Fighters, which was a splintering faction of the more moderate Muslim, uh, more Islamic Liberation Front. So you had all of these extremist jihad groups in the area. But what happened over the past two or three years is that the flag of ISIL, the branding of the ISIL, the ideology of ISIL, and the aggression by which ISIL wants to create a caliphate here on earth urgently gave that added impetus and catalyst for these indigenous jihadist groups to come together. Now, what is quite troubling is that, yes, of course, there's a fog of war, certain reports are questionable, but there is a very uh, great concern here in the Philippines that you have foreign fighters, as far as Yemen and Saudi Arabia, as far as Russia and Chechnya, joining the ISIL, uh, the ISIL affiliated fighters here in the Philippines. A number of foreign fighters were, were, uh, were uh, killed, uh, apparently, based on reports there in Marawi City. So we see the internationalization of what was, uh, what was mostly an indigenous jihad movement here in the Philippines over the past few years. From 2001 to 2014, Philippines and the United States under the global war on terror very effectively pushed a lot of these groups to the underground. But similar to Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which eventually became Jabhat al-Nusra and then became ISIL, we also saw a, a similar trajectory where they went from the underground and then now they're re-emerging again. David, in the Middle East, we have ISIL that announced the creation of a caliphate, which is a region that straddles the Iraq-Syrian border. Uh, that's where the battle is taking place right now. Uh, if the battle is won by Iraqi forces, um, does that mean the end of the caliphate? That's a good question. Um, you know, I ISIL has been preparing itself for a, a post-caliphate world um, with a few different pivots taking place. I mean, ideologically, it's kind of hard for them to cede that the caliphate was lost. Among other things, it puts them at odds with Islamic prophecy and end times prophecy that they have... Um, uh, that they've proclaimed. Uh, at the same time, I think that, that while ideology does matter, all of us are in violent agreement about the importance of ideology, to some extent, this is something that the group can finesse. Um, I think that their success, say, three or four years down the line in surviving their loss of territory and continuing as a militant organization is going to be based more by what happens on the ground rather than how they finesse that narrative. I don't think they're going to fully cede that the caliphate is gone. They're going to pivot it in some direction uh, because they, they, that's part of their narrative that's hard to cede. But ultimately, whether they succeed or fail, I think is going to be driven by things like, can they continue carrying out spectacular attacks? Can they continue campaigns like right. they have for the last couple of Ramadans? Isn't the problem they're going to be one of how this victory is perceived? Because if these are sheer dominated Iraqi forces that are taking the caliphate back, are they going to be seen as occupation forces? Are they, going to be, are they going to be able, essentially, to hold the territory? Well, they are Shia-dominated forces yeah. that have been taking the territory back. I mean, I, I can tell you for a fact that um, in a number of places, like in Mosul, while um, according to you know, the, the reporting from the Iraqi government, this is Iraqi security forces going in, I can tell you for a fact that you have militias who are going in who are a part of that action. That's mm -hmm. definitely happening. And so, I mean, there, it's, that's an issue which gets more to jihadism. Will ISIL be able to benefit? Maybe. But certainly militant groups will be able to benefit from that. Maybe right. it will be al-Qaeda. Maybe there will be a new uh, structure that emerges. Um, so, as I said, these are, these are uh, related issues yeah. with, with kind of different banners and somewhat different organizational structures and strategies. Okay. Dimitri, if we look at uh, Chechnya, is ISIL uh, active in Chechnya? What kind of reach do they have there? Well, uh, I would say that their influence is minimal, primarily because the local population in Chechnya remembers what they have been through 
uh, with the jihadist, uh, uh, with the jihadist leaders from the Middle East in the 90s. Let me remind you that uh, um, Mr. Khattab, you know, one of the military leaders uh, of the Chechen jihadists who fought against Russians, he was from the Middle East, uh, as well as uh, quite a few other commanders. And as we have just heard uh, from Richard, uh, the Chechen fighters are now active even in, su in such places as the Philippines. Uh, they are certainly active in Syria. Uh, that is uh, very commonly known. And uh, the Russian security service even estimates their number in Syria at a few thousand. Uh, so obviously uh, what happens is that uh, these Chechen jihadists, they feel themselves better in the places like Syria or the Philippines because at home, uh, they face a very tough resistance from the local population. Uh, they face the people who remember their activities and who hate them for their activities of the 90s. So what happened in Chechnya was that after the Russian troops returned to Chechnya in the early 2000s, uh, the jihadist uh, movement spread first to the neighboring republics in Gushetia and Dagestan, also autonomous inside Russia with uh, Muslim populations. And then little by little in the last few years, they died down. In Ingushetia, for example, there were no terrorist acts uh, for the last few years, uh, which is a great achievement to my mind. Uh, so basically, I would say that North Caucasus right now is a relatively safe place. Uh, but of course, ideologically, the jihadists still consider this their ground because it used to be a part of the Muslim Caliphate during the Middle Ages. So basically, uh, they can return, uh, but not now, not with the local governments which Chechnya and its neighbors have right now. Right. Abdel Bari Atwan, what about Europe? How much of a danger does ISIL continue uh, to pose for Europe? We've had these devastating attacks uh, in European cities, um, by, carried out by people who pledge allegiance to ISIL, I should say. Um, is that still a big danger? Yes, uh, it is extremely dangerous. Uh, ISIS will be more dangerous and they will plan for more attacks in Europe in particular. Why? You know, because ISIS now lost its caliphate and ISIS believed the West played a major role in undermining this caliphate. Now there are three uh, options for ISIS. Now they get rid of uh, the, the, their caliphate. There is no more education or more health care or uh, other uh, public services which cost them a lot of money and they are running out of money. So they will turn, they will have three options actually. The first option is to dissolve ISIS, which is not going to happen. The second option is to a plan B, which turn to terrorism, especially in the West. The third option is uh, to go for the uh, wilayat or uh, provinces uh, or branches in Yemen and Southeast Asia and Europe and uh, Africa and Libya and so on. So why actually they will be very dangerous when it comes to Europe? Because they believed the West humiliated them. The West undermined their first caliphate they established. And they have a lot of sleeping cells in the West. There are more than 10 millions immigrants from the Muslim world and from North Africa in particular. So they are going to activate these kind of cells. And if we notice recently, after they start to lose territory, after they shrink territory-wise, they expanded terrorism-wise. So I, am, I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if they concentrate their attacks, terrorist attacks on Europe, France, Britain, uh, Belgium, other countries, maybe United States, we don't know yet. But this is, uh, uh, we noticed that three attacks in three months in Britain and more than four attacks in less than three months in, 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 in Paris. So it seems, it seems uh, Europe will be their target because of publicity, because they have sleeping cells and because they blame the West for their downfall. Right. Uh, Richard, getting back to uh, the Philippines, you know, as you pointed out a moment ago, um, these are activists, militants who are also active in Muslim-majority countries in the region, like Malaysia, like Indonesia. Uh, and as you pointed out, borders are very porous. People can cross, militants can cross uh, into other countries. Is there a joint effort? Is there an international effort? Is there cooperation between these countries to counter the threat that ISIL po uh, poses? 
I, for the past two years, there has been a lot of discussion about cooperation among regional states. In fact, the Philippines right now is the head of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, but not until the Marawi siege did we see this sense of urgency among regional states and also international partners. In fact, uh, last month in the Shangri-La Dialogue on the sidelines, I, had to t I got to talk with the Australian Prime Minister, with uh, Pacific Commander of the U.S., Admiral Harris, uh, you know, everyone in the region, uh, even our partners in the West, in the United States and Australia, a lot of them are trying to put aside their differences with President Duterte on issues like human rights and war on drugs. So, so the issue of terrorism is bringing a new focus to regional cooperation. So Indonesia and Malaysia and Philippines are now looking at joint coordinated patrols, more intelligence sharing, fighting against the ISIL uh, ideology and narrative online uh, through cyber activities. So you see all of these kinds of efforts coming together. The United States has sent a unit of special forces to Marawi to provide technical support. Americans and Australians are providing uh, drones and, and, and uh, surveillance aircraft. So everyone is coming in. And interestingly, even China is coming in. So China has released $16 million in equipment given to the Philippine army to fight against terrorist groups. And China is also pushing for joint exercises and also pushing for uh, intelligence sharing for the Philippines. So every major power and all the regional uh, actors that are directly concerned, including Malaysia and Indonesia, are coming in and helping the Philippines. That's why the Philippines is now more confident to get the situation under control. Uh, but maybe we'll be able to defeat uh, you know, these groups in terms of their attempt to create uh, huge you know, caliphates. But the fact of the matter is that terrorism just in Europe is going to be a concern for us. Spectacular attacks are one of the biggest concerns for us. That's why intelligence gathering is also a big issue. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us.